the world's largest telescope, Big Data Industries. They can be found in Guizhou Province, China's backwash. Corresponding data docking is very fast. The government's open attitude makes it very convenient for us. It's definitely an economic backwash. And because of that, we never said we accepted being poor. We're poor, so we want to change. Guizhou's GDP has risen rapidly to become China's second highest, but the urban-rural gap is the nation's number one. The four traditional industries are not growing. The new industry is not quite optimistic. Grassroots people uh, would not benefit. President Xi Jinping said the country has to resolve unbalanced and inadequate development. Good evening. Welcome to The Pearl Report. I'm Diana Lin. Guizhou is one of the poorest provinces in China. Its inclement weather and barren soil are disadvantageous in developing an agricultural industry. But in recent years, Guizhou's economy burgeoned. Its GDP growth soared to the nation's second place. What has it been doing? Taoying Town, Jiangkou County, Guizhou Province. It's a four-hour drive from the provincial capital, Guiyang. Li Wansong owns this tea plantation. Come autumn, Li often returns to check on the plants to ensure a bountiful harvest. Worms have eaten this tea plant. But overall, plants are good, only a bit of damage. Li is a Guizhou native. In his teens, he went to work in Guangdong province. Eight years ago, he brought his life savings of more than 600,000 yuan and borrowed another 500,000 yuan from the government to set up this tea plantation on 1,800 moos of land. He hoped to prosper, but every year, initially, tens of thousands of catties of unsold tea had to be stored away. Friends and relatives nearby helped sell it, but in small quantities. Much more were left each year, not able to be sold for money. Of course, the family was in dire straits. My wife was up in arms, no money. Why wouldn't she scold you? Guizhou is in southwest China. It's the only province with a rugged terrain of precipitous peaks and deep valleys that make access difficult. It's also populated by many ethnic minorities with a low educational level, making it one of the poorest provinces in China. In 2012, the poverty rate reached 27%. Li Wansong's tea plantation made no profit in its first five years. Three years ago, he learned from TV news about e-commerce and tried selling his tea online, developing new markets. His wares reached eastern provinces such as Zhejiang and Jiangsu, clearing out his stock from past years. The plantation now makes tens of millions of yuan annually. Li Wansong learned how to analyze online sales data and adjusted his products accordingly. What packaging, what teas, brands and types are in demand? We package and process the products according to customers' mentality and needs so that our products would be acceptable to our consumers. Li Wansong is not alone in his prosperity. In 2016, Guizhou's per capita income rose to over 15,000 yuan, still below the national figure of nearly 24,000 yuan, but it was a year-on-year -year jump of 10%. Jian Yang Feng owns a fertilizer plant. Li is one of his customers. On this day, Jiang came to the tea plantation to collect soil samples for tests to devise a winter formula for fertilizers. Uh, 
The tea plantation is so big, each plot of land might differ somewhat. Jiang took five soil samples from this patch to analyze what nutrition is missing and custom make fertilizers for it. The traditional way is to follow the bulk formulas of large factories. That way, the formula is set. It would include elements this plot of land doesn't need, so these elements would be wasted. Every square meter of soil is different. The bulk formulas are sold nationally, so naturally the formula lacks individual refinement for a specific place. A fortnight later, with the test results, Jiang Yangfeng went to his small processing plant to produce a fertilizer for Li Wansong's tea plantation. Jiang says applying big data to agriculture is very trendy in Europe and the United States. China lags behind. He says with a startup company, he needs government help to run a viable business. We need data on such things as pestilences and local crops. If I have to collect statistics on pestilences, I'll need a lot of manpower and time. If the government has existing data to give me, it'd be much simpler for me. Because of this, when Jiang decided to form this company, he went on fact-finding tours of Hangzhou, Shenzhen, Yunnan, Inner Mongolia and many other places. He claims he found the Guizhou provincial government has the deepest knowledge of agricultural big data and the most comprehensive data bank. For instance, the summer temperatures atop Junko County's Fangjingshan are below 20 degrees. But at the mountain's foot, it's above 30 degrees. With such a unique climate, the peak, the slopes, and the foot of the mountain would have different terrain and soil structure. When we asked the governments of many places nationwide for such data, they didn't have them. But Guizhou is the most comprehensive. Guizhou began formally developing a big data industry in 2014. The following year, Chinese President Xi Jinping toured the province and said, Guizhou developing big data definitely makes sense. In 2016, the country's first national big data integrated test area was set up in Guiyang, attracting related industries to set up shop there. Seeing the development of big data, Jiang Yanfeng last year bought a finance company and invested in the fertilizer business. He even moved into the test area's startups town. He says here he can see what the government is doing for the big data industry. For instance, the rent for his 1,000 square foot office is only 20,000 yuan a year. Late last year, he was given a government subsidy of 100,000 yuan. They come to your door to tell you what to do, to tell you the government has this money, free. Not free, it's a gift. They taught us how to organize, how to apply for government information, took the initiative to teach us. Otherwise, we wouldn't know, as a startup, how to deal with the government. When our annual tax reaches a certain percentage, the government will reimburse us the whole sum. More vital than the preferential policies is the Guizhou government's open attitude. When we started this company, we quickly went from registration to getting all the relevant data, no obstacles at all. We were very welcomed. They willingly give us the data. Compared with other provinces, the government's unimaginable openness facilitated us in surmounting all sorts of problems. It made it very convenient for us, and it greatly encouraged us. Pushing the most high-end big data in the most backward province, can an economic myth be created? In 2016, Guizhou province's GDP rose more than 10% year-on-year to 1.2 trillion yuan. It was the second fastest in a nation that saw 6.7% GDP growth. Guizhou's big data industries, information transfer, software and information technology services rose 48%. This is a global trend that uh, any province that uh, uh, would like to develop this uh, data industry as well. For Guizhou, I don't see that they have any comparative advantages. 
some of those state enterprises or the private sector that had already invested in Guizhou have something to do with connections with the central government as the former party secretary of Guizhou, Chen Min, has already been transferred to uh, Chongqing. They may not be able to develop into a IT hub as it was intended to. Weijo's economic figures are indeed impressive, but are the lesser educated grassroots benefiting as well? Coming up after the break. Welcome back to the Per Report. Last year, the highest inhabitants per capita disposable income in China were in the East, Shanghai, Beijing and Zhejiang. The lowest were the western provinces of Tibet, Gansu and Guizhou. At the 19th Party Congress that just closed in Beijing, President Xi Jinping said the main social contradictions are changing and the country has to resolve unbalanced and inadequate development. Is Guizhou's economic success a good example of resolving imbalances? Jian Yanfeng hails from Shandong province. In 2004, he came to Guizhou for university and stayed after graduation to start a business, then a family. My son and daughter went to buy clothes. The family is settled here. I've moved my parents here because I'm an only child. That's my generation, just me and my family. I settled here, then my parents came. In 13 years in Guizhou, from being a 20-year-old university student to becoming a fertilizer factory boss, Jiang witnessed the many changes. He recalls being shocked when he first emerged from the train station in Guiyang. Emerging, I saw a traffic policeman on duty, but he was riding a bicycle with a blinking police light on its rear. I clearly thought how China could still have such a backwash. It launched reforms and opened up 20 years ago. How can it have such a place where traffic policemen ride bikes at work? How can they give chase to a car, say, in a hit-and-run accident? <laughs> On this night, Jiang Wanfeng dined with friends. Eight out of ten of them are from other provinces. They chatted about buying train tickets to return home for the holidays. Jiang has been in Guizhou for over a decade and learned the local dialect early on. But now he says he has a lot more chances of speaking Putonghua. After I graduated, I can say it was hard to find people to speak Putonghua with. Now, around the dinner table, you'd feel uneasy if you don't speak Putonghua. Everyone speaks Putonghua because around the table, everybody has come from different places. Like these folks who've come from other provinces to seek their fortunes in Guizhou. It used to be rare, but with its burgeoning industries such as big data, Guizhou is attracting a lot of talent. From 2012 to 2016, the number of high level experts here grew from 77,000 to 156,000. It used to be every time friends got together and you met new acquaintances, they'd ask, you're from Shandong? Why are you staying here in Guiyang? Why not return to Shandong? I've replied to this often asked question for a decade, but now few ask it because everyone is used to this new phenomenon. <laughs> Traversing provinces, lorry driver Guo Jianying drove more than 20 hours from his native Gansu with 10 tons of apples to the wholesale food market in Guizhou. 
This cargo was okay because it's big, has a nice color. Our apples are like that. They're delicious. We can sell most of them in two days because they sell well in this market. Guo Jianying says transporting a lorry load of apples costs 5,000 yuan. After paying for petrol, road tolls, room and board, he can earn over 2,000 yuan. Eager to do another transaction soon, the driver also wants to sell the wares quickly, and Guo couldn't help himself from helping with the sales. A round trip is costly, so most drivers don't want to return with an empty vehicle. Guo says he used to have to wait until the owner of the cargo sells all his goods before he can drive to the information department to find another source of freight. For instance, if the cargo was sold by the afternoon, I could drive to the big car parks near the information department, park the lorry and stay in a motel overnight. At 6.30 to 7 a.m. the next day, we again started looking for freight at the information department. If we found some cargo by noon, we could leave. If not, we stayed in the afternoon and waited for cargo and looked again the next day. If we were unlucky, we ended up staying two to three days. But now Guo doesn't have to wait to sell all his apples. He can return to the motel and together with his companion from Gansu, start looking at his cell phone for more business. This mobile phone app has 4.5 million subscribers, or 60 percent of lorry drivers nationwide. Guo Jianying says the app has a lot of information on a variety of freight and owners' requirements, etc., thus changing drivers' modus operandi. Basically gathering in one place all the information department's sources of goods. There's a lot more information on goods, so there's no need to go from one place to another. Just sit in the lorry or lie on the bed and get the cargo. Very convenient. The internet information platform company that developed this mobile app is headquartered in Guizhou. It started in Chengdu, Sichuan in 2007. In 2014, when Guizhou began developing big data, provincial officials proactively invited the firm to move there. Frankly, it's definitely an economic backwash, but because of that, Guizhou's government and its 40 million people of disparate ethnic groups never said we accepted being poor. We're poor, so we want to change. We must catch up from the rear. We must develop road logistics infrastructure. Frankly, this has to be a joint effort by the government and us. A company can't do it alone. To boost the development of enterprises, the government gave money and land to help build a permanent industrial park. Companies only have to pay rent. In the three short years this firm's been in Guizhou, it has expanded from 200 to 3,000 workers, becoming the nation's biggest information platform. Every day, it handles 140,000 cargo transactions worth 1.7 billion yuan in freight costs. The data gradually accumulated up to now, however, we excavated, purged, analyzed and refined this data's underlying discipline and trends. In the end, you still have to undergo market transactions for them to produce something of value. So at the time, Guizhou built big data centers, exchange centers. They're comprehensive. They weren't built on their own. Enterprises weren't asked to develop by themselves. I think this industry support is crucial. In three years, Guizhou lured not only small and medium enterprises, but also giants such as Tencent, Microsoft and Apple to set up shop. A better economy boosts people's income. In 2016, province-wide inhabitants per capita disposable income reached over 15,000 renminbi. 
but urban inhabitants were 26,700 renminbi, while rural dwellers saw a 10% increase in disposable income, it's still just 8,000 renminbi. The urban-rural income gap is 3.3 folds, the biggest such disparity in China. The gap has been huge in the past years. First, because Guizhou is a mountainous region, so agriculture itself is not quite developed. Traditionally, the four big industries, namely charcoal industry, electricity industry, tobacco industry, and hot liquor industry. It's not a labor incentive in the first place. So a lot of those are grassroots people would not benefit IT industry and big data industry, which need a lot of uh, people to have uh, some uh, high education background, which the traditionally Guizhou do not have or cannot provide them with. So I don't see why the gap would uh, narrow down in the near future. This village in Qingyan town is an hour's drive from provincial capital Guiyang. Chen De Siu, 58, spent most of her life in this field growing rice and vegetables. For Chen and her husband, farming isn't looking at big data but watching the skies. Rain is good when planting, bad when harvesting. It should be sunny. Crops can't dry in the rain. It wasn't raining on this day, so the couple rushed to harvest the crops to take it to the market to sell. E-commerce blossomed when Guizhou started developing big data. But Chen De Siu says she never thought of selling her veggies online. When online is somewhere you can drive to, is there really a chance these traditional farmers can ride the crest of big data? By the end of 2015, Guizhou's debt rate reached 189%. That's the highest among all Chinese provinces, and warning bells are ringing. As this economy grows, will Guizhou be able to surmount this obstacle? Well, thank you for watching our show. It will be re-aired on Monday, Tuesday and Saturday, as well as online and on mobile apps. Until next time, from the Pearl Report team, good night, good luck and good health.